Thumbs up. Now, I want to also jump over to the bottom of page 416 and talk about this environmental site assessment. Makes more sense here. Now, when we were dealing with value, I asked you a question because I knew this chapter was coming and I set you up then. That was my rope a dope. Here comes the knockout. I asked you at the time, how, what is the value of a $100,000 property with a $2 million environmental cleanup? And we at the time determined, based on that word transferability, that the value was zero because the environmental cleanup way exceeds the value of the property. All right. So now the second part to that question is how would you like to have been the bank that loaned $100,000 to that buyer to buy that property? Do you ever think you're going to get that money back? Because he now can't sell the property. So what we have created in the last 30, 40 years is when a commercial transaction happens, before the lender actually gives the money to the buyer, he makes the buyer ask the seller for what is called a phase one environmental study. It's there in the book. A phase one on page 416 in the bottom chapter. A phase one environmental study is nothing but a search of the property, much like if you remember a title search we talked about, and I showed you that Bob sold to Bill, sold to Sue, sold to Mary, and the title search showed who the owner was. A phase one virtually is the same concept, but instead of showing actually who the owner is, it also keys in on what was the use of the property. So it was a gas station, maybe, to a gas station, to a gas station, to a gas station, and you're going to sell it as a gas station. That's literally what a phase one would be. It's very comparable to a title search, but it figures out the use rather than the owner. At the end of that phase one, a professionally licensed engineer would make a educated assumption based on the history of this property, we conclude that there probably could be some environmental issues on this property and we recommend a phase two on this property. A phase two is literally now where they would hire an environmental lab, much like I was working for, to come in and you've probably seen those machines that drill core samples in the parking lot. And they literally take samples of the core or the soil back to the lab and then they run experiments on that sample and they can tell based upon the chemical composition, hey, we found octane in the soil. If we found it in the soil, what does that mean was happening with the tank? It was leaking. Therefore, there is an environmental concern on this property. And then the bank would go, whoa, we're not giving you the money, Mr. Buyer, because that property is contaminated. So they stopped that potential example I ask you by using this combination of a phase one and a phase two so that the lender never actually okays the buyer for that $100,000 loan. Now, if there is a problem, then the seller must clean it up. 
And Cameron, this speaks to your point. I've seen cleanups back in the late 90s that were $250,000, $300,000 because what they would literally have to do is go in and dig all the soil up and take it to a special place to remediate it. Cameron? So say for that cleanup cost for being 250000 at your house, could they put a lien on your house for that? Well, if you didn't pay it, yes. But probably most of those companies would want paid up front or have paid up front. But anytime they work on your property and you fail to pay it, yes, they can put a mechanics lien on your property. Even the environmental company that did the report, that $1,500 for the environmental, you didn't pay it, they could go get a judgment against you and put a lien on that property, yes. All right. So what would happen in that scenario, and you guys have seen plenty of old gas stations just sitting vacant on a corner, right? Now you can understand why. If the cleanup is two or three hundred thousand dollars and the property was only going to sell for a hundred, why would the gas station spend the money to even sell it? It's cheaper to just let it set. And if you think about 31 in Edgewood, if you think about Fry Road in 31, Stop 11 in Madison, all of those were vacant gas stations for a long, long time until in the last five or 10 years, the value of the land has come up and then Starbucks bought the corner of Edgewood in 31. And then CVS bought Madison and uh, Stop 11 and Shell gas station and Qdoba and all that there at Fry by the corner of the, the mall. So the value would have to be higher than the cleanup. That's why you would see a lot of them sitting for a long time because the cleanup was more expensive than the value of the property. So that's a phase one and a phase two. Now, potentially that guy at the end of the phase one could go, it looks pretty clean to me. It's been farmland, 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 farmland. We're okay with it. Then the lender would give the buyer that hundred grand and he'd buy the property, all right? <clears throat> so uh, the point is that phase one could go either way. They could require a phase two, or they could say the property is free from the hazards of an environmental issue, depending on what that research came out to be. So what does this mean for you as a practicing agent? Once again, I go back to that point of, this means that probably your best bet is to say, time out, PCBs. I remember talking about that we probably ought to call an environmental engineer in because that was a word we discussed. I'm not an engineer. You better call somebody, all right? So that's probably going to be the extent of what you're going to do. The lead-based paint's probably the most common. You may get into a little bit of mold issue, maybe some asbestos, but other than that, unless you go into the commercial world, most of this you're not going to run into or have to deal with. And the easiest answer is, let's call an environmental engineer. All right? Any questions on this chapter? Shauna? You had mentioned about the wetland protections and possibly something on the test being asked about that. Can you? Yeah. On page 417, there's a thing called the environmental impact statement. <clears throat> when a developer builds a large housing addition, remember we talked about he would come in and put the roads in and the playground. <clears throat> he would also do this environmental impact statement to see how his housing addition is going to impact the environment around them. Part of that might be that if part of his land is wetlands that is protected, he couldn't build on that wetland because they want to protect whatever, the tree frog or the flying sloth or whatever that is in protection. 
if it is designated truly a wetlands, finally somebody got the flying sloth joke. <clears throat> if it is truly a protected wetland, then he would have to account for that in his environmental impact statement and say, oh, even though I have a hundred acres, I can't build on all hundred because 10 of them in the back are migratory uh, duck wetlands that the geese land in and are protected. So I cannot build on those properties. So that's basically what the wetland and the wildlife protection, if they are designated, then we can't use them to live on. So builders have to know that. And they do this and they capture that information in a impact statement. How is my housing addition going to add to the noise, the traffic, the schools, the fire departments? That would be all impacted by this 100 house addition. On top of that, there's wetlands that are protected for the geese, and then there's the flying toad sloth that I've got to protect, so I can't build on those lands as well. All right. Any other questions? Ladies and gentlemen, you have completed the book portion of the course. Give yourselves a round of applause. <clears throat>